Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As a young teenager, I often tried to be at home in front of a television on Saturday afternoons at four o'clock. Do you know why? Well, that's when ABC's Wide World of Sports was on. I loved Wide World of Sports. I loved their spanning the globe to bring us the constant variety of sports, the human drama of athletic competition. On Wide World of Sports, you could see almost anything, auto racing, bobsledding, track and field, diving competitions. In the days before the incredible expansion of cable TV and the growth of ESPN, Wide World of Sports was the only sports program that went beyond the sports stables of American life. Baseball, football, basketball, and hockey. I loved them too, but I really loved Wide World of Sports. And of course, anyone who's ever seen Wide World of Sports will never forget the opening of the show with Jim McKay's inimitable voice and most memorably that phenomenal catchphrase, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And if you remember that, you remember the scene that went with those words, the agony of defeat, every year from 1970 on. It was film of Yugoslavian ski jumper Vinko Bogataj at the World Ski Flying Championship in Obertsdorf, Germany, losing his balance halfway down the ski ramp, careening out of control off the end of the ramp, tumbling down into the snow below, and being stopped by a retaining wall. Fortunately, he only suffered a mild concussion, but it is amazing footage. It makes me cringe every time I see it. The thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. Today's gospel reading makes me think of that. Yep, last week, the thrill of victory. Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, and Jesus is exuberant. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. Well, Peter's chest must have swelled with pride. The smile on his face must have been a mile wide. When the Lord has asked the question, who do you say that I am? Peter had given him the right answer. And Jesus was unbridled in praising him. This week, though, it's the agony of defeat. It's the same day, just moments after Jesus had asked his pointed questions on the road to Caesarea Philippi, who do people say that I am? And who do you say that I am? I think that question is the most important in all of Scripture. We all have to answer that question for ourselves in our lives. Well, Jesus is still on that very same road with the disciples, and he's speaking to them after Peter's confession. Matthew writes, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And then the gospel says Peter took him aside, meaning Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block. It makes me cringe. In the blink of an eye, Peter falls off the ramp, slim, slips from saint to Satan, from blessed to curse, from foundational rock to stumbling block. As Peter went from the fill of, thrill of victory to the agony of defeat, wow, what happened? What's going on here? Why did Jesus get so worked up? It's a critical issue. It has to do with who Jesus is and what he was about. It has to do with Jesus' own self-understanding of what it meant to him to be Messiah. His self-understanding differed from what others understood by that term with what others meant when they spoke of Messiah, including poor Peter. Peter and the rest of the disciples were likely following Jesus because they thought he would be a kingly figure like King David of old. This kind of hope was the predominant messianic expectation in Israel in Jesus' time. They likely wanted a political leader who would be able to overthrow the Roman Empire with all its wickedness and cruelty and restore Israel to the glory it had known in David's time. Power glory and riches, and a restored Israel, yep, 
That's probably what Peter and the other disciples had in mind. It's probably why they were following Jesus. But Jesus, the Messiah, being handed over to suffering, dying, being crucified, these were not on Peter's radar screen, and they certainly had nothing to do with his understanding of the word Messiah, God forbid. As one scholar noted, the Messiah was expected to inflict suffering and death on Israel's enemies and on the wicked within Israel, not to experience it himself. For Jesus, however, to be Messiah was to be the servant of God, ushering in God's kingdom, God's reign. And for him, this reign of God was very different from the reign of the kings and emperors of his day, or the rule of the religious authorities who controlled Judaism. In his proclamation of the kingdom of God, Jesus offered a vision that sharply contrasted to the realities that then existed, the realities of the power of Rome, the realities of religiously compromised Jerusalem. In many, many places in the gospel, Jesus gives us a clear picture of what God's rule is about, of how God's kingdom looks. He provided a picture in Matthew's gospel very early on in the Beatitudes so familiar to us from the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Or think about what he had said in the synagogue early in his ministry, when, according to Luke, he read from a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to pro proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And remember, he rolled up that scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And Luke writes, the eyes of everyone in that synagogue were fixed on him, and he said to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Or consider how Jesus answered John the Baptist when John was in prison. John wanted to know, are you the one? He sent some of his own disciples to ask Jesus this question, are you the Messiah? Are you the Messiah, or are we to wait for another? And do you remember how Jesus answered? Jesus said, go and tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised and the poor have good news brought to them. Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God announced a new order and a new set of priorities. It was a total reversal of the status quo. Those who lived on the margins of society were being brought to the center. Bring them in, Jesus shouted. The poor, the blind, the lame, the sick, and the suffering, bring them in. Of course, this proclamation was a threat to the orderly, systematic oppression that the religious and political power brokers and the wealthy had established in order to retain power and control over the poor and the weak. Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God put them on notice that their days were numbered. But, but, Essential to Jesus' proclamation of God's kingdom was his death. His death and the cross and the resurrection. The resurrection which would serve as vindication of the message and the messenger. As Jesuit priest and scholar Thomas B. Rausch rightly states, his death was tied in with his mission. So when Peter, poor Peter, blockhead, rockhead Peter, says to Jesus in response to Jesus' clear words about the suffering that is to come, God forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you, Peter is threatening to obstruct everything Jesus is about. Peter is threatening to obstruct everything God is about through Jesus. Peter becomes a stumbling block to the kingdom, and Jesus lights into him. I imagine Jesus' vehemence is in part because Peter's words represent a temptation to Jesus not to go forward, not to go forward to Jerusalem, not to undergo great suffering at the hands of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and on the third day not to be raised. Wouldn't it be easier just to go back to Nazareth and 
whittle away the hours as a carpenter and die peaceably in old age. Get behind me, Satan. Satan literally means adversary. Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Now, you are asking why. Why does God choose to work this way? Why isn't Jesus teaching and preaching and working miracles enough to announce and inaugurate the kingdom of God? Why is Jesus suffering and death? essential to the mission. Again, Thomas Rauch is helpful. In his book, Who is Jesus? Rauch writes, The cross shows us a Jesus who will not turn away from God, who remains focused on the one he calls Abba in total vulnerability, even at the cost of his life. Jesus' refusal to meet hostility with hostility, sin with sin, is the antidote to the endless cycles of revenge and violence. Roush concludes, Jesus' entire life was to proclaim God's reign as a reign of compassion, freedom and peace against the forces of evil, whatever dehumanizes human beings or denies them their freedom. How, Roush asks, could he renounce those values even to save his own life? From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ requires us to pattern our lives after his life. His values must be our values. The kingdom he proclaims must be the kingdom we proclaim. It is these things that constitute the true religion and goodness referred to in today's collect. These are the fruit of good works. Our baptismal covenant calls us into his life so that we might also preach good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to free the oppressed, and to proclaim the Lord's favor to all who feel marginalized, excluded, alienated. This often places us in distinct tension with the dominant principalities, powers, and values of our own age, consumerism, materialism, empire, and hollow cries of we want God, when in fact this often represents greed for more personal power. The cross does not represent the agony of defeat, but rather represents the victory of Christ and the kingdom of God. It is our central symbol of the Christian life, a life of compassion, of self-denial, and sacrificial service and suffering for the sake of others, even to the point of death. The cross is our central icon of faith and calls out to us, take me up, take me up daily. We hear a great deal of rhetoric about God today and about those who claim to be followers of Jesus. How do their claims measure up to Jesus' own understanding in life? How do their lives measure up? How well do they, we, reflect cross-bearing? What do we say? Who do we say Jesus is? What do we mean by this? And to what kind of life does it call us?